Great. Well, welcome everyone um, to the 1,225th meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington. Today is January the 6th, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. <laughs> to do it. Okay, so um, happy new year, everyone, and welcome to a very Hi, snowy, wintry Washington, D.C. Um, I hope everyone is, is doing well and staying safe uh, given our current circumstances. Yeah. Alexa, set the timer for 30 seconds. Don't forget to mute yourselves as we um, proceed with the meeting. And know that the meeting is being recorded and that it'll be posted on the YouTube channel. So if you don't wish to share your video, um, then your name will not appear in the recording and you can remain anonymous if you wish. <clears throat> okay. So this is the first meeting of the, of the year and it follows the um, society's elections that took place uh, during our December annual meeting. And so I'd like to first welcome our newly elected uh, officer, who's uh, Matt Buffington, uh, who was elected as uh, president-elect. And he's here. Um, I saw him, so you can wave and you can, you can see him there. Uh, Jamie Zanizer uh, proceeds from president to past president. And Jamie, I, I think I called you Zanizer and, or Zanizer, so I'm not sure. <laughs> And thank you, Jamie, uh, for leading us the past year. And um, I look forward to working with you in the coming year. I'm Lourdes Chamorro, and I proceed from president-elect to president. And I'm honored now to preside as the president of the society. And this is a society with a long and rich history that's associated with the museum that I love deeply uh, and with entomology and entomologists of the region. So this is a great privilege uh, for me. Uh, we have returning officers, and they are Alan Norbaum as program chair, Elizabeth Young as membership and communication secretary, and they are also there, and they can do a little wave there so you can see their faces. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Nick Silverson as curator. Gary Hevel as recording secretary. Hi, Gary. Mm -hmm. Abigail Kula as treasurer, and uh, Mark Matz as editor. And the auditing committee cons consisted of Tom Henry, Brent, Proshek and it was chaired by Yan Wook or Wugi Kim. And the nominating committee consisted of uh, Stu McKamey, Floyd Shockley, and was chaired by Paul Goldstein. So we'd like to uh, thank the members of the executive auditing and nominating committees for their continued service and dedication to the society. So since October of 2020, We've been um, on this online format for our monthly member and executive meetings. And this is due to, to the pandemic that we're all experiencing right now. Um, we were able to meet in person for our annual banquet that was held in September at Wooden Sanctuary. And, and what we all hope to soon gather in person um, at the National Museum of Natural History where we used to meet um, this, this is a welcome change, um, and we hope to provide this online option um, similar to the hybrid forum that we use during the annual banquet um, once we're back in person. Um, so we want to also thank you, especially the members um, and those who are present here today. Uh, our membership makes the society possible, and I encourage our members to continue the tradition that has started uh, 138 years ago in 1884 of engaging, sharing, and discussing entomology. And I also encourage you to reach out to me and membership or to the membership, members of the society with ideas, questions, and suggestions. And if you want to serve in the society, um, you, you should let us know by contacting our nominating uh, chair, Paul Goldstein, and we, we welcome um, membership involvement. So thank you very much. Um, I, I think all of you already know that we have a YouTube channel, and this is where all of the recordings were, are currently um, uploaded. And the channel is called NSOC Wash DC, 
and you can watch all the previous meetings. And uh, we can post the uh, link here on the chat for everyone to, to go to, to that one. Okay. So now we um, will go to reading and approval of the minutes by uh, Gary Hevel, our recording secretary. And he will read the minutes of the 1224th meeting that was held in this, on December. Gary? The 1224th regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington was convened at 7 p.m. on the 2nd of December, 2021 by President Jenny Zanizer. Due to the continuing COVID crisis, the meeting was held virtually with 40 members and guests in attendance. Recording Secretary Gary Hevel read the minutes of the November meeting and these were approved. Membership and Communication Secretary Elizabeth Young reported that there were six new membership applications, those being Alexander Gonzalez Haldren, P.R. Shawshank, Alan H. Smith Pardo, Uria Okeatu, Nain Hawk, and Subic Sen. President Zanizer presented the customary State of the Society, in which he thanked members of the executive committee for their service, and then noted the many accomplishments of the society during the past year. Membership is healthy with numbers of new members during the year. Special thanks were given to Cecilia Escobar for her advice and leadership for virtual meetings, and David Adamski, who led the Young Entomology Group, having started in 2012. The proceedings edited by Mark Metz has thus far this year included nearly 700 pages with 40 articles. President Zanizer then conducted the election of officers for 2022. This year is exceptional in that the current officers have agreed to continue their duties. Thus the slate is Abby Kula as treasurer, Alan Norbaum as program chair, Elizabeth Young as membership and communication secretary, Gary Hevel as recording secretary, Mark Metz as editor, and Nick Silverson as curator. Matt Buffington has agreed to serve as president elect. These officers were approved by the attending members. Members were reminded to renew the member memberships by using a Google form. During show and tell, several members offered a look at books, mostly new, but some that are considered worthy of reading or purchasing. Matt Buffington showed the book to make a spotless orange. Don Weber noted the kissing bug and biological control. Rosser Garrison offered the man who shot butterflies. Pina Litwack presented mosquitoes of the world. And Art Evans showed the two volumes, Silent Earth, and pollinators, predators, and parasites. Program Chair Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker of the evening, Jennifer Ware from the American Museum of Natural History, whose presentation was titled Dragonflies and Their Evolutionary History. The systematic data has largely utilized the venation of wings for analysis, but this is not always reliable. Currently, the number of families in the suborder Zygopta is unstable with differences of opinion. Research using DNA is currently popular and usable DNA has been gained from museum specimens dating back to 1909. In odonate studies, it has become clear that investigators should be collaborators because presently there are not enough workers. At the end of the meeting, Jamie Zonizer virtually passed the society gavel to Lourdes Chamorro, who becomes the new president for 2022. The meeting was adjourned at 8.30 p.m. Great, thank you very much, Gary. Um, are there any amendments, corrections?
Do, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I hear a second from Jamie. Second. Yeah, from Ray and then Jamie. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, minutes are approved. Do I hit the gavel there? <laughs> okay, we now move to reports of officers. And um, the first uh, will be from, from Ab Abby Kula and treasurer's report. She's not here, but um, the auditing committee finished the reports and they found, this is an update from, from, um, from Abby, and they generally found the finances to be in good order. So that's that's an update to that. Um, President-elect Matt Buffington, do you have anything to report? Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, so um, I'm working towards the annual banquet, which is the primary task of president-elect. Um, I do have a speaker, Jay Hostler. Uh, I will come back to him during the presentation of exhibits because uh, he is uh, uh, an author of note uh, and he'll be, he has agreed uh, once we decide on a venue, because we're still figuring that one out and a date, which we're also still figuring out and that might be dictated by the venue. So um, keep, keep that in mind. It will be the summer and, uh, and we'll, we'll stick with that for now. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Uh, from uh, program chair, Alan Norbaum. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I could just announce, I guess, that our speaker for February is going to be um, Will Kuhn from Discover Life in America. That's on, gonna be on February 3rd. And uh, I guess I could also report that we have at least 40 participants in tonight's meeting, at least there's 40 Zoom connections and I can see multiple people in at least one box. So somewhat over 40. That's great. Great, thank you. Um, any other um, officers present in the meeting that want to provide an update or report? No, okay, great. Uh, so we'll move on to uh, Elizabeth Young, and she's our membership and communications secretary, and she will introduce our new members. And if there are any visitors, then we can have them introduce themselves. And uh, Elizabeth? Hi there. Uh, yes, uh, we do have a new member, a new member for January. Uh, their name is Eamon McCarthy Earl. Uh, we also have six official members that were announced in December. Uh, so those are Alexander Gonzalez Hallgren, uh, PR Shawshank, Alan H. Smith Pardo, Jaria Okayasu, uh, Naeem Hawk, and Subic Sen. And uh, if there are any visitors in attendance, uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves. We'd really love to hear from you. No? Okay. That's it, My name is Larry Henderson. I'm visiting from the American Entomological Society outside of Philadelphia. Oh, welcome. Hi, Thank welcome. you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other visitors? No. Okay. Uh, yeah. One last announcement, uh, it is the new year. Um, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, it is time to renew your membership if you haven't already. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, first, we request that you fill out our online Google form. It's very, very easy. Uh, there's a link to it on our uh, membership page of entsoshwash.org. Uh, and you can uh, pay uh, by PayPal, which is also linked on our website, or by check sent to Abby Kula, our treasurer. Um, I will, I, I, I've received a few questions. Uh, we're in the process of updating our website and, uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, George Foster, 
sorry, I'll, I'll finish what I was about to say. I was just going to say that uh, the link to um, our uh, uh, membership still says 2021. It's, uh, I just want to say that uh, the, um, the link still works for 2022 and everyone who has renewed their membership uh, since uh, November uh, have been essentially renewed for 2022. So even though the link says 2021, it still works for 2022. We haven't gotten around to fixing that, but uh, that's about it. Please renew. And uh, we'd love, if you know of anyone who'd like to join our society, we're always seeking new members. So, uh, that is all. Great, thank you. So any unfinished uh, business that I'd like to bring up? Any new business? Okay, so we'll move on to presentation of notes and exhibitions of specimens. And I know Matt Buffington said he had uh, something to show and I, I have a, a little something to show as well after you, Matt. Hi everyone. So the, the speaker that we have um, lined up for this, this summer is the author of the Sand Walk series. This in, in particular is a introduction to Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection. He also has uh, a number of series about uh, bees and other insects. And he's really um, quite the artist and storyteller and also a professor of entomology in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I like his style for outreach and scientific communication. I think that's a, a, a real special gift to be able to do that in such an effective and broad scale. Um, you know, we got this book at, a, at our local comic shop in Bethesda. So it's like, he's fairly well uh, established out there. So um, as we have typically in the past with the banquet had uh, a speaker with a book that could be signed, there'll be a lot of things that hopefully uh, he can sign this time around, including individual uh, issues and such like that. So um, uh, message me if you want uh, any more information on this, but there's a, a whole series of things that, he, that he's done, Jay Hosler's his name, so, and you'll see him this summer. Thanks. Great, thank you. Anybody, anybody else that has anything to share? Uh, was present here. Well, in October, I was in Mexico and I uh, came upon an interesting type of salt that contains ant parts. Um, and so apparently this is cardamom and ant parts and they call it um, hormiga chicatana. And I had never heard of this before. And I, I still haven't tried it yet uh, on anything. So I have to, <laughs> I have to um, see what I put it on. I'm not quite sure yet. Uh, so I'm, I might have to do a little bit of research, but I don't know if anybody had ever heard of anything like that before. No. Yeah. So we'll see, but maybe on fruit, I'll try it. <laughs> Okay, if there are no more um, things to share, then um, I transfer over the uh, presentation to Alan Norbaum, our program chair, who will introduce our future speaker, past president, Dr. Jamie Zenizer, National Identification Services, AFAS PPQ here in Washington, DC. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Lourdes. Um... The, uh, it's a tradition of the society for our past president to um, always give the, the January um, presentation. So our speaker tonight uh, doesn't need that much introduction as you've seen him all for the past year. But um, Jamie um, graduated with a PhD in entomology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2008, where he studied the systematics of the leafhopper subfamily Deltocephalini. He continued his research on this group as a postdoc at University of Illinois and the Illinois Natural History Survey, partly funded from an NSF awarded project to develop online and traditional identification tools 
and a revised classification for deltocephalony. In 2015, he was hired by USDA APHIS PPQ as an area, area identifier in San Diego. And in 2017, he began his current position as a national taxonomist with PPQ at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. There he specializes in identifying cichadelity and other heteroptera, continues his research on leafhopper systematics and curates uh, parts of the collections of heteroptera and cichadelity. And before um, Jamie starts, um, just like to ask everybody at the end, if you have any questions, please use the, um, the raise your hand um, option. If you, if you move your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a toolbar and there's one um, area that says reactions. If you click on that, then one of the options you'll see is, is raise your hand. And I'm gonna do that right now. And you see if you, if you click on that, it moves your box to the very beginning of all the boxes so that you know, we'll be able to, to see you and, and calling you to uh, ask your question. So um, thanks for that, everybody. And um, Jamie, um, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Al. And let me try to share my screen here. <clears throat> And can you see that? Yep. How's that looking? It. Yeah, okay. it looks good. Great, and you can see my cursor moving here too? Yes. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Al, thank you, Lourdes. Uh, looking forward to the new year with you at the helm and happy to help out in any way that I can. Um, so, of course, as Al, uh, mentioned it's traditional for the past president to give the first talk of the year and so I'll uh, give a talk about um, kind of a long pro long standing project that I've had um, going let me see if I can minimize that a little bit okay um, on this tribe called Faltalini and so uh, it's basically I did a revision of the tribe Faltalini and um, I'll show you a, a bunch of new species that I described and some of the revisions that I did and show a phylogeny that I came up with in a uh, hypothesis on the evolution of the recipitry in the group. First, I thought maybe uh, I'd just have a quick refresh course on leafhoppers. Uh, uh, the family Cicadelidae is a very large family in the order Hemiptera, a suborder Ocinorhynchia. Uh, it has 22,000 described species, so it's a very large, large family with estimates of over 100,000 uh, undescribed species out there. They're currently classified into about 25 subfamilies with some uh, revisions of that number underway. Leafhoppers uh, are members of one of three different feeding guilds, so some of them feed on xylem sap, for example, the sharpshooters. Some feed on cell contents like the micro leaf hoppers and the subfamily Typhlosabini, and many groups feed on the phloem sap, like the delta cephalines that, that I've been studying for uh, the past number of years. Uh, leaf hoppers produce these tiny proteinaceous particles called bracosomes. Uh, they're produced in the malpighian tubules in the hindgut of the leaf hopper and extruded from, from the anus in these droplets. Um, the, uh, fluid droplets, and they take these droplets and spread them all over their body. So that's what uh, some people wonder what these rows of CD are for on their legs, which is another characteristic um, of, of leafhoppers. They use these CD to spread these droplets um, containing bronchosomes all, all over the body. The, uh, the, the liquid dries and it gives them a really hydrophobic coating over their entire body. Leafhoppers also house endosymbionts in organs called bacteriums and, and that are in the abdomen. They usually have a, both a primary and a secondary endo, endosymbiont, and these help provision the leafhopper with nutrients that are absent from their relatively nutrient poor um, sap diet. 
leaf hoppers are vectors of plant diseases. And these might be uh, viruses or bacteria or, um, or fungi that have parts of their life cycles in both the plant and also in part of their, uh, and, and partly in, in the leaf hopper themselves. Um, so um, this fact makes a number of leaf hopper species uh, economic, very economically important. It can ca cause um, a lot of damage to, to certain crops. And the subfamily that I've studied mostly is called Delta Cephalini. It's currently the largest subfamily of Cicadelti. It has 39 tribes, about 925 genera, and about 6,800 uh, described species is distributed worldwide. And it also contains a, a, a high number of vector species. And Faltalini, the subject of my talk tonight, is one of these 39 tribes. And so it's kind of, it's a moderately small tribe, I would, I would say, with 13 genera and 63 described species, and is distributed solely in the New World from the um, southeastern United States um, down through South America, through Argentina and Chile. One interesting um, feature of the tribe is that there's a, a lot of variation in wing length wing length um, within different genera in the tribe. So there, so some members are fully macrophorous, so they have fully formed wings um, pictured here. Uh, some are brachypterous, which have the shortest wings, uh, and some are sort of in between. So again, the, the, these, three, these three are the three genera that are fully macrophorous, Bonamus, Hecalocorica, and Tenucephalus. And so they have fully formed four wings and fully formed hind wings. So um, this picture here, this SEM of the, of the hind wing is what you would see if you kind of popped off both four wings. So it's a really large um, flying wing, uh, the hind wing here. Here are some examples of, uh, of some in-betweeners. So, well, this is just uh, one species, Acrolithus brevis but similar conditions are also present in the genus Heculus. And in, in Acrolithus, the female is what I'm uh, calling subbrachypterous. So that is, it, so it's not fully brachypterous, so they're not, they, these wings are not quite as short as in fully brachypterous species, but um, so they're shortened in the female here. They're rounded at the tip. Uh, you can still see some um, some wing veins that are as more or less well defined, and the hind wing. Um, so, if you were to take this female and sort of rotate it counterclockwise 90 degrees and take off this right forewing, this is what you would see here under SEM. And so, this is the hind wing here. Um, it's basically a really small hind wing. Um, it's more or less fully formed in that it has a, a wing base here and uh, uh, the leading edge or the anterior margin is, is here and it, it wraps fully around uh, the, for the, the, the um, trailing edge or the posterior margin uh, wraps fully around to the wing base here. And of course, here's a more detailed view of that. So it's basically like just a really small um, uh, hind wing that of course is not functional in flight. And the male here is uh, what I'm calling submicropterous. So the forewing is somewhat shortened. It doesn't totally cover um, the, the abdomen. So it's somewhat shortened. So I'm calling that submicropterous. And here are, uh, Here's an example of a fully brachypterous species. And this is present in eight genera, which are um, I, where the type genus of the, of, of the tribe is found, Faltala. Uh, and so in these eight genera, they're totally brachypterous. So the forewing is as short as it can be. It's more or less quadrate and the wings are tightly coupled together. And again, if you kind of rotated this, 90 degrees counterclockwise and pop the, uh, those four wings off. This is what you would see here under SEM. And so 
uh, the, the hind wing is this tiny little flap here. And so this is the, the metatergum here. And so if you take a closer look here, the, um, there, this is where the wing base of the uh, of acrolithus here was, but it, it's, it, it's, you, it's be hard to really call this a wing base here. So the, the hind wing really just meets the metatergum like right here, just this tiny little flap of tissue and the posterior margin meets the metatergum at the posterior margin of the metatergum here. So it doesn't even, it doesn't fully wrap around to where the wing base was as in acrolithus here. And under just regular light, it doesn't really look like much at all, but so that's why I'm using uh, SEM primarily here. So that, that was actually a really useful tool to be able to look at this. Excuse me. Okay, so um, faultal lines are found in both neotropical forests, so mostly um, fully winged species are um, associated with forests, and the first ones are found in, in grasslands in the new world. A number of species have this disruptive color pattern, which is similar to what you find in certain other animals out there that, that live in grasslands that help them blend in with their surroundings. This is kind of my cheesy little demonstration of how this works. It just kind of disappeared right in front of your eyes. Thanks for under not laughing too hard. Um, okay, so the uh, fault lines are, uh, um, superficially similar to some other leaf hoppers, for, for example, the tribe Hecalini. So because of this, the, sort of they have this elongate and flattened um, structure, the structure of the head and the body that is similar to Hecalini. And because of this, a number of taxa have, uh, as, as they were described sort of earlier in the 20th century were placed into the tribe Hecalini. And so this is a little bit of a boring history of some of the taxonomy of the group. Um, but just the point is more or less that they were placed in Hecalini for a long time. Until in 2000, Andy Hamilton uh, revised the, uh, the New World Hecalini and provided a, a, a better definition of, of Hecalini and excluded most of those genera. And in 2004, just kind of as a side note, my actually first taxonomic paper was um, on um, describing a few species of this Baltala group and discussing its relationship to, to other delta cephalini. And um, eventually, I, uh, along with uh, my PhD advisor at the time, Chris Dietrich, we described the tribe in 2010 in one of the um, papers resulting from my from my dissertation. And so again, as I mentioned before, I studied the systematics and phylogeny of delta cephalini. This is one part of the, the, the phylogeny of delta cephalini and part of which we used to, as the basis um, for um, supporting the description of the tribe both the line I. And so these analyses of delta cephalini were based on 152 taxa, molecular and morphological data. And they showed that uh, strong support for a clade that included a Micropterus uh, genus, Tenucephalus, one of these in-betweeners, Heculus, and one of the fully Brachypterus genera, Cramorana. And so based on this and also shared morphological characters amongst other taxa in the group, we described the tribe Faltalini. Whoops. And so this is, I just wanted to show this uh, phylogeny um, quickly. Um, Yahuing Chow, so, who is a, a, a postdoc at the University of Illinois with, with Chris Dietrich, um, is sort of leading this effort for, to put together this extremely large um, uh, phylogenomic data set with uh, over 700 terminal taxa and over 160,000 
um, nucleotide position. So this is kind of a really uh, huge data set based uh, solely looking at the phylogeny of Delta Cephalani. So this is uh, kind of a recent effort and uh, the first paper of this um, project is in review now. And I'm happy to be play a small part in that. Um, and I just wanted to show the position of Paul Kalini in this phylogeny is relatively derived and closely related to these other two tribes, Delta Cephalini and Paralim Nini, and also one, uh, well, two other small tribes, Dory Cephalini and Tatarto Stylini. And within uh, Delta Cephalini, grass feeding and, and feeding on grasses and sedges is plays a um, is a prominent feature of a number of groups, and that has been uh, traced onto this tree here. And you see at the base of the tree, um, non-grass specialists uh, occurring early in, earlier in the evolution of the group, and grass specialization uh, transitions to grass specialization happening once or twice, depending on how you optimize um, the character and being lost a, a, a few times or reverted back to non-grasses and a few other lineages here. And so you can see that fault line I here is placed well within this, this large grass specialist um, group. And you see a, a few gray branches here because we actually don't know the host for a, uh, one group of fault lines, which I'll explain later. So over the years, I've been kind of accumulating a lot of specimens um, from a combination of field work in Argentina. This is me kind of working my butt off out in the field with the, with the bug back. Um, also getting specimens from other colleagues from different places in Mexico, the United States, um, Peru, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, and also accumulating some material from different collections like Ohio State, which houses the uh, Dwight DeLong collection. Dwight DeLong was a big leaf hopper worker in the 20th century. Um, and so based on those, I had a lot of specimens. And then when I arrived at the National Museum here in DC in 2017, I all, all of a sudden had access, like I could really kind of comb through the collection here. And I found that probably at least a dozen more new species that I didn't know about before. So. Um, that was um, that really expanded this project and it did take a lot longer, but overall it was a good thing. And so, uh, and a few other specimen loons. And so, based on all this, you know, at some point, probably, probably around 2014, when I was getting all this material, at some point I figured out I needed to describe this stuff and um, have been sort of working on and off at different times when I could um, on this project and finally brought it all together this year when I finally published the, the revision of the, of the tribe. And so it was published in Zootaxa. Uh, it's a full revision of the tribe, including um, descriptions of the 13 genera, um, not full descriptions of all the species, but keys to all the genera and keys to all the species. I described uh, two new genera and 36 new species, made some changes to the classification, and also performed a morphological phylogenetic analysis of, um, of the tribe and took a look at the evolution of wing length based on that phylogeny. Uh, I found some characters that, that helped to define the tribe. I'm not really gonna go into a lot of detail here, but this is a character of the, the male uh, pygopher that was helpful. Also, some characters of the, the female ovipositor were, were useful in defining the tribe. In, in defining the tribe overall, it's a really morphologically diverse tribe, um, so it's a little bit hard to define morphologically um, by single characters that are shared by all. Um, but I gave it a shot anyway. Um, I uh, also defined a, three different uh, informal genus groups in the tribe, and I'll referred to these later. One is the tenucephalus group, which includes tenucephalus and bonamus. These are both fully macropterous genera. 
a, a group called the Heculus group, which has two of the in-betweeners, uh, Heculus and Acrolithus, and the third Macropterus genus, Heculocorica, and the Faltala group, which has eight fully Brachypterous genera. And I also found some characters that help to unite um, the Heculus group with the Faltala group. And so here's the phylogeny that I produced. So I used uh, solely morphological characters, 51 morpho morphological characters um, with 40 in-group taxa. So any for, for all species that I had at least one male and one female of, I included in, in the analysis and two outgroups in the tribes, uh, Delta Cephalini and Paralimnini with, of course, all, all genera of, of Faltalini included in the analysis. And it was resolved as, as monophyletic, not too surprisingly. The monophyly of, of the tribe was not really strongly tested here because I only included two outgroup taxa, but based on the results of other analyses, including those molecular analyses that I showed before, there is strong evidence otherwise that it is monophyletic. And the uh, the tribe is, uh, the phylogeny is sort of divided into two, two main parts. The first being the tenucephalus group containing uh, Bonamus and tenucephalus, which is this clade here, relatively strongly supported by parsimony bootstrap. And this lower group, which includes uh, the Heculus group and the Faltala group. The Heculus group includes three genera. The fully Brachypterus Heculocorica is the first diverging genus and Heculus um, present in the Southwestern United States is here. And Acrolithus is the other included genus here described from Venezuela. And finally, the Faltala group is monophyletic here, and this again contains all fully Brachypterous taxa. So now I'm just gonna kind of walk through and show you some pictures of, of some of the species that I kind of got to look at and describe. Um, and so this is basically um, just sort of an overview of the, the revisionary part. So if it's not too boring, but hopefully the pictures will be enough to get you through. Um, and I'm, for the beginning page of each of the genera, I'm just kind of highlighting their position on the, on the phylogeny here. So this is Bonamus. Um, I described one new species from Brazil. Uh, it just contains two species currently. And I removed one, one species that was um, previously included in the genus uh, to the, uh, transferred it to, to tenucephalus and help to define the tribe more, or help to define the, the genus more precisely. I also included SEM images for, um, for at least one member of each of the genera to illustrate the um, important defining characters of the, of the genera. And this is the distribution of the genus Bonamus. So the new species was described from up here, Rio de Janeiro, this is Brazil. I don't know if you can see that too well, but um, Rio would be a little bit off the screen here. And the other previously described species, Bonamus lineatus is from uh, north, uh, Northeastern Argentina and Brazil. Uh, the genus Tenucephalus turned out to be enormous, uh, contained lots of new species. Uh, previously contained just five described species and I described 21 new species um, and transferred one species from, from Bonamus to, to, to the genus. I probably should have explained before when I uh, showed Bonamus that um, the male genitalia are some of the, uh, contain the most diagnostic characters at the species level. So we always illustrate them. So that's kind of, that's what you're seeing here mostly. This is actually a part of the female, the seventh sternum, but the rest of these are all parts of the male genitalia. And so 
Um, those are, again, very important in, in describing new species of leafhoppers or uh, characterizing species. So, and I'm not really going to go into much detail, except um, they're interestingly shaped. Um, the tenucephalus is also interesting in, in having this real, this is a female actually that, that, that's illustrated in the habitus here. It has this extremely long ovipositor, um, much longer uh, than in um, most other, um, at least delta cephalines that I know. The, the pygopher, the genital capsule of the female ends here and then the rest of this is the, is the ovipositor sticking out. So again, it was just really interesting to, whenever I got a sort of a, a new specimen of tenucephalus to look at, it was kind of exciting because there was a good chance it was gonna be a new species. Uh, here's another sort of interesting species that had really bizarre male genitalia. Um, I won't go into too much more about that. And there was, uh, so this is, these two are sort of the more typical color pattern, um, more or less yellow, often with these, this uh, white stripe at the interior margin bordered by black above and below. But then I found about five species that had this a different kind of color pattern. So I, I included them in an informal species group, the interstinctus species group. It's kind of this spotted color pattern. Uh, previously, um, the described species, there, there was one from southern Mexico, two from Panama, and one from Bolivia, and one from Peru. Um, so all these other dots here, with the exception of that triangle, are uh, new species and new localities for species of tenucephalus, many of which are new. So you see many of them kind of in the um, western part of the um, of the rainforest here, the, near the base of the mountains. Uh, what was pretty new about a number of these was that this totally new distribution um, for, uh, for tenucephalus, a number of species that I found in uh, southeastern Brazil and uh, south, southeastern Brazil and northeastern Argentina. Some of them actually collected in uh, serrato type vegetation, which is um, a little bit different than um, the presumed habitat of some of the other taxa. Okay, so moving into this lower part of um, the, phylo the phylogeny, Heclocorica um, contains just one known species described from Costa Rica uh, by Mervyn Nielsen. And I uh, described and illustrated the female for this first time, and um, this helped support its placement in the tribe. And also um, was able to borrow some nymphs from, um, from the University of Costa Rica, and it has some interesting characters that are pretty unique for nymphs of, um, of Delta Cephalini. So I illustrated some of those too. Um, Moving down in the phylogeny, Heculus uh, contains three described species, one of which was new uh, that I described. This uh, was the first described species, Heculus bracteatus. This is Heculus bali, has a, the female has a really long head, pretty different than the male. Um, this is one, one of those genera that is um, the female hat is sub subbrachypterous and the male is fully macropterous. And again, I described one species from Mexico. Um, I actually described the species only from the female, which is again, uh, it, we like to usually have a male to describe a new species, but this was obviously. Uh, different from the from the other two species included in the genus, and I felt it was important enough because the it where it came from was so far from 
uh, where we pre previously knew the other two species um, that I thought was important enough to describe and distinct enough uh, based on the female to, to describe, but hopefully we'll find the male um, in the future with more collecting in the area where this was found. And so this is um, southwestern United States where the two previously described species, um, Heculus brachiatus in yellow um, and Heculus bali in black have been described and found. And the new species, Heculus mexicanus is um, from way down here in Mexico. So very far from, from where the other two species are known. Acrolithus is known from one species described from Venezuela. Venezuela. And I guess that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> uh, I il illustrated it, illustrated the nymph. Um, I, again, this is another one of those in-betweeners with the subrecipitous female and sub submicropterous male. Uh, moving down, now we're getting into the Faltala group, so totally brachypterous uh, genera. The, the following eight taxa will be totally brachypterous. And the genus uh, I described a few years ago with my colleague Juan Cambodonico. And um, at that time, we just described one species. And in this revision, I described two more species. So now has a total of three. Um, I, my colleague Juan, I think, is a, a fan of, of Star Wars. He, so uh, he decided to name the genus after Admiral Akbar of the Resistance. And at first, I thought he was a little, uh, a little off his rocker. But when I looked a little bit more closer, I thought, oh, maybe he's onto something there. There's, I think there's some sort of resemblance there. So kudos to you, Juan. Um, this is the distribution of, of Akbaria. Um, there, again, there are three species. The uh, first described species, Vermiformis, was found at all these three sites, both the yellow dots and at this site. Um, you've seen this picture before because I've showed it. Um, this is, uh, I found a number of species of Faltalini here at uh, Li Hue Colel uh, National Park in La Pampa Province, Argentina. Um, so that was a really cool site. Um, let's see, there, and there's um, a sec second species that I described in this work from high elevations in uh, northwestern Argentina. Moving down the phylogeny, uh, Ecucephalus contains two, two species, one of which I described here. These are known from Chile. Um, these are the two localities from the two described species quite close to each other. Uh, probably more work needs to be done to, um, to do more collecting um, to help define um, the previously described species. Uh, and one new genus that I described, I named after my PhD advisor, Chris Dietrich. Um, I called it Dietrichana. This was kind of a treat to find. It's, it's got this enormously long, elongate head. Um, on the left is the female, on the right is the, the male. This is the female at the top here. Um, and uh, here's a, a few more pictures of it. It's a nice SEM of the dorsal view of the head going back to the hind margin of the Brachypterus forewings. And this is a ventral view of the face. And again, I found this one at that same locality that I mentioned before at Li Hue Kalel National Park. The genus Virgonana contains two described species. Uh, they are only known from Chile. The genus Chlorindia contains six species, two of which I described here. And the distribution is um, in, uh, in northeastern Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. Um, 
and Brazil should be shown. Well, maybe, oh no, okay, that's not true. Um, not Brazil yet. <laughs> um, so um, this is the distribution of the, the species in the genus. Uh, moving down to Faltala, the type genus of, um, of the tribe, um, contains six described species, three of which I described as new here. One of, one of which I named um, Faltala viscacha after the plains of Viscacha. Um, the, these little guys were running all around the, the campground of um, El Palmar National Park in, in Argentina, which is sort of north of Buenos Aires. And um, it's the same park where I, I collected this species among other, other places. Um, and these were just too interesting not to, um, not to do something with. So I had kind of a little fun naming the species after the, the Viscacha. Um, yeah, cool creature. Um, Let's see, here's the distribution of Faltala. It's pretty similar to, to the previous genus that I showed, um, Chlorindia, so sort of in um, northeastern Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay. Uh, the genus Cramerana contains six described species, one of which is new. And the one new species, so these dots here in Peru, this one black dot and these dots down here are Cramerana. Um, and so this, the new species uh, uh, Saltensis was described from, from Argentina here and kind of produ uh, provides some sort of geographic link between the previously known distribution, which was really disjunct. But there's probably a lot of work that needs to be done in, as far as collecting and I'm sure tons of new species to be discovered here, not only in Cramerana, but in other um, genera of the tribe. And the last genus is Paracloridia, which I described as new, containing three described species, two of which were new. And I transferred one species um, from, from the genus Chlorindia to Paracloridia. And this, the distribution here in um, and the, with the triangles is Paracorindia. So kind of Eastern Argentina, Uruguay, and one species, the new species um, in uh, sort of Northwestern Argentina. So that's it finally for the revisionary part of, of, the, of the talk. Now I'll talk a little bit about just uh, sort of uh, my thoughts about the evolution of, of, of wing length in the tribe and uh, wing, wings in general in insects. And so this is this quote by uh, Wagner and Lieber um, in 1992, I think uh, sums, it, sums it up well, what I like to call the, the irony of brachyptery. Um, their quote is, the evolution of wings is heralded as the most important is the most important event in the diversification of insects, yet flight wing loss has occurred in nearly all tergo insect orders. And so that's true, it's, and it's happened many, many times uh, throughout, throughout insects. They've, um, they've lost their wings, certainly true in many different groups of leafhoppers, independent losses all over the place, and also in other Ocanorinca as well. And so, of course, um, wings are extremely important. They do a lot of things for you. You can get to lots of different places, um, uh, access different food resources, all sorts of important things um, which help you get along. But um, they incur a cost. So there's an investment of energetic resources to the, to the development, uh, use, and maintenance of wing of the wings themselves and of wing mus musculature. And also they're kind of big and floppy and um, they can be a liability in um, preventing you to, from, from getting certain places. So if you can take care of uh, at least the most important of these 
um, these aspects of life and do it without wings, then it might be beneficial for 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 you for for the insect to to lose the wings. So that's why it's occurred so many times. Um, there are some uh, important consequences to, to the loss of wings or brachyptery, uh, including increased levels of genetic differentiation and higher speciation rates, um, higher rates of molecular evolution, genomic evolution, and also potentially higher risk uh, to extinction uh, for these species that might be more localized or isolated. There are any number of different reasons, ecological sort of pressures that people have uh, put forth for um, to explain the, um, the loss of wings. Um, and these are some of them. Oh, cool. And now I'm going to go through my, my phylogeny and um, just sort of outline the, the steps leading to brachyptery um, that at least this, this phylogeny suggests. And first, I want to uh, just make a point that, I, of course, I used use morphological characters to uh, reconstruct um, the phylogeny, including two characters of wing length. So this this has, um, it could be criticized for being sort of tautological. Um, so I've used the, the length of the wings themselves to explain uh, how they've evolved. So it's important that if we were to take this further to have a, um, a molecular phylogeny um, that was independent of, of the morphological characters. And so my whole point with this slide is just to show that so far, as far as we can tell, um, the, the phylogeny that I've come up with is congruent topologically to um, what we have reconstructed from, from the molecular data. We need a lot more representation in, in, uh, for different important groups in the, the molecular phylogeny, but um, so far the, the basic structure of this phylogeny is supported. So um, macropterie is kind of the, um, uh, the, ans the, um, the ancestral state of, uh, in, in the phylogeny here. It occurs um, so both in the, in the outgroups and in uh, this, the, in the tenucephalus group, so bonamus plus tenucephalus. These are um, totally macropterous, and these are primarily um, neotropical forest dwellers. There are a few species that, uh, of tenucephalus that, that I briefly mentioned before that have been found in short vegetation like the Cerrado, but for the most part, they appear to be inhabitants of forests. Um, but more work sort of needs to be done on figuring out exactly where they live and what they do and what they feed on. And moving down the phylogeny in this lower clade, the first diverging genus is Hecalocorica, and that is uh, totally macropterous. So it, it still, um, if you're following along the phylogeny on the branches here, there's still no change. Um, uh, or there are no transitions of any of the characters. So just to maybe explain a little bit more there, I included two morphological characters, one for female wing length and one for male wing length. And so far they have not changed in our progression in the phylogeny here. And so again, Hecalocorica is described from high elevations in Costa Rica and Paramo vegetation. And on this branch, we have um, an unambiguous optimization of um, our first wing character, um, a transition from the female micropteri at the base of the tree to um, subacryptorous female. So that is present in um, Heculus here, which is the genus coming out here. And at this point in the phylogeny, the male is still macropterous. So there, there's just one character change here. 
the next change um, is in the mail um, going from Micropterus to sub Micropterus. So that occurs in the genus Acrolithus. And finally, we have two changes on this branch um, from male, or excuse me, from female sub Brachyptery to full Brachyptery in the female, and from male sub Micropterus to full Brachyptery. So, um, but in, in this clade, the Faltala group, both are totally Brachypterous. So that's kind of the stepwise transition from, from metcroptery to, to brachypterie that is suggested the, by the phylogeny. And um, doing a little bit of hand waving and uh, surmising, um, the, this, uh, this group is more or less associated with, with forested habitats. They're metcropterous. Um, these sort of kind of represent um, architecturally complex habitats. So um, to get around and to do what you need to do as a leaf hopper in the forest, you kind of need to fly. Um, falling down is a liability and uh, trying to find your, refine your host plant um, is, is important. So you kind of need wings to do, to be able to do that. Um, while in this group where we see the evolution of brachyptery, most of them are associated with grasslands or sometimes the paramo, which are sort of these high elevation um, uh, habitats with uh, including grasses, but also with sort of um, shorter shrubs. And so these, um, these habitats can be uh, considered to have sort of low architectural complexity or habitat heterogeneity and um, thus um, be more conducive to the, to the evolution of recaptory in these groups. So I think that's a plausible explanation, but I don't think um, that's necessarily the, the full explanation because there are plenty of other leaf hoppers um, that live in grasslands that aren't recaptorous. So there are probably many other um, explanations that sort of need to be considered some of which I've outlined here, but I don't really want to get into too much detail here. Um, but one one thing I kind of want, wonder a lot about is what's what's the role of the uh, cryptic or disruptive color pattern of these leaf hoppers, is and, and also the elongate, flattened shape. Um, does that have something to do with um, uh, allowing them to to evolve this brachyptery or this this sedentary lifestyle? But I, I kind of feel like I've just really scratched the surface with this group. Even um, there, there's still are a lot of species out there to be discovered, a lot of a lot of diversity that needs to be described, um, and sort of more more questions to be answered. But um, yeah. And finally, I, I couldn't I couldn't resist just putting in a few more uh, pictures of these hind wings. So this is. This is Dietrich Canna, um, and uh, this is the, the hind wing of that, this sort of square quadrate thing that, that's, again, a totally brachypterous group, and just this vestigial little hind wing here. And this is uh, Akbaria, um, possibly the smallest little hind wing flap that, that I've seen in, in any group. So, my brief conclusions are it was really kind of a pleasure to, to work on this group over the years. Um, it kind of surprised me at a lot of different turns. Um, it was a lot of work, but it was also a lot of fun. Um, I uh, described a few new genera, two new genera and 36 species. I uh, revised the taxonomy um, and classification for, for the whole group, including keys and illustrations of, of many of the species. And I proposed this sort of stepwise evolution of brachyptery um, where that's associated with, with living in grasslands. I'd like to thank a lot of people for their, their help in, in this study and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jamie. Um, just 
want to remind everybody, please use the uh, raise your hand uh, function. Let's see, Matt Buffington's got one. Yeah, sure. Matt. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. That was a, yeah, that's a lot of work. Um, very impressive. Um, something that I'm working with right now is how confident I am in assigning a certain biological trait to large clades. And I'm wondering how confident are you in this grassland versus non-grassland um, assignment? And it, it seems like a lot of those could be easily mixed up. And, and uh, how do you go about coding something like that or mapping that? Right, uh, definitely a good point. Like, as I mentioned, within tenucephalus, that, that one big group that is Again, mostly associated with forest, there are there are a few species that that we find in in Cerrado. Um, so um, I don't think you can easily just. I, I'm making some generalizations here for sure, and and trying to describe the, the, the evolution of Brachyptery, but um, it's it it, it 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 is hard to make generalizations for sure. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you, you do what you can, you know, you give, give the best ex explanations that you can with what you can observe. There's also just a lot that still needs to be figured out about, about these things. So what are they feeding on? Uh, even for the, the, the tenucephalus that um, have been collected in forested habitats. So what are they feeding on? Are they feeding um, on understory things? Are there grasses in the understory that they might be feeding on? Um, so I don't know, I guess I feel like there's still just, there are a lot of questions still <laughs> for, for sure. Uh, Lourdes? Yes, no, this is fantastic work and uh, it's very uh, inspiring. Um, so congratulations on getting that published. Um, I have a few questions and comments. Uh, I wasn't sure if you indicated the number of specimens that you you examined and it seemed from the maps that perhaps a lot of them were based on on very few specimens and and so are they rare how rare are they how many specimens um i collect the weevils by sweeping and so i get a lot of these things so now i have not these like precise but plant hoppers and so now i have a better appreciation and uh, now i know who to give them to and, and then with the, the way that you were collecting, uh, what can you expand a little bit on, on your methodology? Okay, sure. Um, as far as the number of specimens, it of course varies. Some in just a few rare instances, I think it would be, they were based on one or two specimens. Usually at least there was some series of specimens that I, that I was dealing with. Um, it was uh, somewhat rare to have multiple localities for the same species, um, especially in, in, in tenucephalus. Um, there, there, it just seemed like almost every series of specimens that I came across was, was a different species. It was more of a rarity to find multiple localities for the same species. Um, but um, as far as collecting, so I showed that one picture of uh, me using the bug vac. So in grasslands, that's like a really effective way just to collect a ton of specimens. So you can get very long series. So especially for those, those precipitous things that I, I collected in Argentina and were collected by other people by bug vacking in other parts of South America, um, you can get lo long series of specimens. Um, so, you know, tens, twenties, hundreds of specimens even. Um, and so that's a good way to collect in grasslands. Of, of course, use a sweet net too. Um, a number of the collections, especially um, in the forested habitats were belay traps. So there, there were a bunch of samples that were, that were at, the, at the museum um, where I found a lot of those new species of tenucephalus. And so th those were belay trap samples. And so again, for in the malaise trap samples, again, you can get long series of these things. Um, so so for, for the most part, I'd say there, there are good series for, for most of the species, but not all. Uh, 
Uh, Jill Swearingen, Warren Steiner. Yeah, hi, we both have a question. Um, I'm curious about the generalized shape of the leaf hoppers that um, seems to be really standardized, you know, very elongated, stretched out, football y kind of shape. And um, what's the feeling among leaf hopper specialists as to why, you know, is it um, more for like camouflage along when they're hiding among grasses and other plants because they could maybe look like a bud or you know some other structure or is it for aerodynamic stuff or you know what thoughts do you have on that i'm just curious yeah i think um especially well okay i'll just first say that within leaf hoppers themselves there is a it's a pretty diverse group so that you are going to find like lots of diversity of different different shapes um but sort of the there are some characteristic shapes like like you mentioned and um so sort of this this flattened shape um that's uh elongate flattened sort of elongate head that happens a lot in these grassland groups um, and it's popped up multiple different times in unrelated groups that, that feed in grasslands. So um, I, I think it could be um, uh, for sitting, uh, well, okay, for example, that one with the really long head, the, the new genius that I described, uh, Dietrich Canna, um, you know, they sit kind of flat against the, the grass blades. Um, and so I think that's probably, um, and that uh, 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 helps them be cryptic in, in sitting on the grass blades. There are some other groups that do actually resemble um, grass seeds. So they have this really long um, head that kind of sticks out when they're, when they're sitting on a grass blade and makes them look like a grass seed. So there are probably a, a, a good number of different explanations or different things that they're doing. Um, yeah, if that answered your question. Okay, thanks. Yeah, or maybe a combination. <laughs> yeah, I think probably lots of, yes, <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, uh, okay. Jamie, great, great work, uh, <laughs> monumental stuff. I was thanks. curious to see a lot of the, uh, your, uh, <clears throat> oh, what's your favorite genus? Haltala? Haltala? Anyway. It and its relatives often had fake faces on their butts. A lot of insects do this. But I was wondering if you studied any of that, like uh, the predation on them, or uh, were they trying to mimic something? No, I, 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 I spots on the last, second to last abdominal segment, Turgum, and uh, the. The genitalia looked like a beak, you know, like a, a, a mm -hmm. wicked mouth that you wouldn't want to get bit by. So, <laughs> yeah, interesting observation. I, yeah, I, I no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really look at that in, in detail at all. Um, there are definitely other leaf hoppers and other delta cephalines lines that, that have eye spots um, on their wings, for example, um, but. Yeah, that. Um, uh, yeah. So, so were were you referring to any particular genus in in, in the ones that I showed here? Well, um, definitely the Brachypterus females uh, of your Hautala and oh, what else? I don't know. Some of the close relatives. Um, okay. I mean that you know they. It's the exposed abdomen that develops the uh, color pattern. And uh, a lot of them had those dark eye spots. And I've seen a lot yeah, of yeah. insects. I mean, there's caterpillars, there's scarabs, all kinds of stuff unrelated that have false faces on their rear ends. So Yeah, now, now that I'm, I'm thinking that the Akbaria, the, the one that named yeah. after Admiral Akbar, um, <laughs> That uh, that that does have a black butt basically, um, and the way that they move around is a little bit squirmy. Like uh, they they sort of move that abdomen around, and so yeah. Now that I'm thinking, I, I, that really hadn't occurred to me before. But yeah, that could kind of be yeah, like a, a false face. 
could be spider avoidance or mantid or whatever. I don't know. I'll have to take a look with fresh eyes and new new ideas to, to take a look at them. Thank you. There's a question by uh, Catherine Tober. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Jamie. That was really a nice talk. Oh, thank um, you. Beautiful study. Um, I was surprised with the uh, the high degree of asymmetry in the male genitalia of some of your species, mm -hmm. and I was wondering how that the degree of asymmetry sort of falls out on the phylogeny. Is there any pattern there? I did not look at asymmetry on the phylogeny, but there are a good number of species that have um, an as asymmetrical idiagus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not too uncommon in leafhoppers. Usually it's right. symmetrical, but mm -hmm. it wouldn't be too unusual to find um, an asymmetrical idiagus. Um, and so that that does occur in the group, but let's see. I guess I'm not sharing my screen anymore, am I? Maybe can I do that? You still are. Oh, I am. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Well, was... <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, let me. So, can you see my um my presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can't. <laughs> you scroll back. <laughs> anyway. Um, let me min minimize this because there is actually one really pretty interesting. Um, there you are. Okay. okay. Um, this one species of tenucephalus. Um, this is actually. The first case that I know of, and I've I asked people about it in a leafhopper um, of uh, asymmetrical styles. So, okay, so mm -hmm. this is the structure that we're looking at here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this is the internal genitalia, and this is this part is called the connective. Um, the idiagus is in here. It's a little hard to see, and then this other thing is a big process. But then mm -hmm. um, these paired structures are the styles. And that, those are called the paramirs in, in other groups of insects. Yeah, okay. And usually they're mirror images of each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in this case, they're not. Um, they're, you know, folded right. over, they're, they're not mirror images of, of each other. And I had three males and I dissected them all and they're still all exactly like this. Oh, boy. Um, and so I showed this to a few different people and they said, no, they haven't seen this in, in leafhoppers before. Um, mm -hmm. So something similar occurs in some delphacids that they knew about, but not leaf hoppers. So that was kind of kind of interesting. Yeah. So here, here's an example of the styles that are mirror images. It's a little hard to see, um, but are this are the the spines on that one on the on my screen would be on the right side. Then the absence of spines on the other are is that. Just a matter of the photograph, or no? Um, the, those are those are a little seedy, uh, uh -huh. maybe yeah. thick seedy. Um, and no, I, I, I think I think you're seeing correctly. Okay. So, are you talking about like? Well, the, on the previous the one that you just showed. There uh, yeah. Sorry. Right. This is mm -hmm. this is a little bit obscured. There's okay. So there's a a piece behind this oh, style okay. that, that's okay. showing through. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, maybe I could, if I could show it. Okay. Here, here's here's an example of uh, paired okay. styles that mm -hmm. are mirror images of each other. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. No, it's it's really. And how many? Is it a lot of the species that have the asymmetry, or is it unusual? Well, for the styles, only that one that I know of. Um, okay. For for the idiagus, um, it's I would say probably at least ninety percent have it oh, symmetrical. Okay. Symmetrical, so it's, okay. it's somewhat rare to have it asymmetrical. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any ideas on the purpose, <laughs> the function of the, the asymmetry? Oh, geez, 
no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Fred, Fred okay. Harris thank has you. a question. Okay. Fred? Hi, Jamie. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about, uh, on another note here, early in the talk, you mentioned that there was 150 vector species. And um, vectors for what? I'm, I'm presuming this is probably yeast, fungi, bacteria, that kind of stuff. Can, yes. Could you, could you specify maybe any particular pathogens or something that are vectors, that they are vectors for? Okay, um, let's see. So there are, there's a genus called Nephotetics. Um, they're the, the green rice leaf hoppers. Um, they transmit something called Tungra virus of rice. A virus, and, okay. Yeah, and so there, there are viruses that they transmit. There are um, bacteria, they're sometimes uh, called molecutes. So these are like extremely tiny bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they can transmit those. And I think there are also some, some fungal pathogens too that they could transmit. Okay, yeah, I know there's a ton of microbes and I didn't know if there was something that is pretty well known that like harming crops that is of a particular interest in agriculture or something. Um, that's that's yeah. why I was wondering if you knew, right? But you yeah, mentioned- the, yeah. There are many, there are, there are many leaf hoppers, yeah. Uh, so the, the, the green rice leaf hoppers, a big one here in the United States is the glassy wing sharpshooter. Yeah, um, right. And so that transmits a, a bacterium um, of the phloem, xylella. Yeah, I heard of that one, right. Okay, great, well. Mm -hmm. Just uh, curious, thank you. Yeah. George Foster has a question. Sure. Yeah, hi, Jamie. Um, it's quite a treat to talk to a leafhopper guy. I've never never met a leafhopper guy, so. Oh. glad to meet you. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite pleased with your presentation. Um, just a simple, basic question, you, you're, your specimens when you're out collecting, are they all in alcohol or do you, do you pin them or how are they preserved? Yeah, sure. When, when I do collecting, I, I usually collect them straight into, into alcohol, um, into a vial. Um, they preserve well and uh, it's easy to just put them in the vial and, and um, bring them home and point mount them um, back home. Um, but, uh, you know, people in the past, of course, have collected them dry. Um, but yeah, I, I, I use alcohol. So you, you do point mount them after drying them out of, out of the alcohol with, with ethyl acetate or? No, I don't, don't use ethyl acetate. Just uh, take them out of the ethanol and let them dry on a, on a piece of tissue paper and point okay. mount them. Yeah. Because I've been doing the study of salt marsh uh, diptera, and um, I mean, sometimes it's overwhelming the, the amount of uh, leaf hoppers that are in the net. And sometimes you can't even see the flies in there for the leaf hoppers, and just what uh -huh. I discard them, and I'm like, well, maybe I should save them for you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay, thank you. You're, you're, yeah, you're collecting in salt marshes out uh, in the eastern in Delaware. US. In Delaware, okay. yeah, Rehoboth, Rehoboth Bay. I'm doing okay. a study of chloropids there. So if, if you'd like me to save them, I'd be glad to. Cool, cool. I may not have a whole, be able to get to them, but I, yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the idea. Totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's, e it's easy to collect a lot of leaf hoppers, I'll tell you that. I know. Man. Uh, like, well, like you, like you found, so. Um, yeah, the, yeah. Net, the net can be full of them. Yeah, yeah. Just it depends on the time of the the season, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And Edward Burrows has a question. Hi, thanks for your well illustrated talk. I can see it was a lot of work. I'm wondering, could you talk anything about local leaf hoppers? Are your fatalines in this area? 
How many species are around here? Do we have many invasives? Are there any invasives that are really big problems? Kind of interested in what we find locally in the DC area. Okay. Um, there are a lot of species in the United States. Um, a number off the top of my head I don't have, um, but in the United States in general, I would say in the number range of two to 3,000. Um, but um, it, uh, more locally, the, the, there are certain, certain groups that are characteristic of the, of, of the Eastern United States that you'll find a lot. Um, it depends on you know where you're collecting, how you're collecting, but uh, um, certainly native species out here. We do have a number of invasive species. Um, a lot of those, at least in Delta cephalini, feed on sort of invasive um, grasses um, that, that have also been imported from 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 Europe. So um, yeah, we have, we have a whole host of. Um, you know, invasive species, a lot, most of them from Europe, I would say, um, but some from, from some other regions as well. Yeah, I was looking at um, the Maryland Biodiversity Project while you were talking, and I think they have about 251 species with photos, some without maps yet and so forth. And I did notice, I just I did a very quick check and there were two Japanese species. I guess one was feeding on Japanese maples and I, I don't know what the other one might feed on. But yeah, Japanannus hyalinus is, is, is that one that feeds on maples. Um, and I'll let you know, a lot of times they're not big pests, um, but they, you know, they find a way to, to live and um, make a home here. Um, it's a little hard to say what their total impact is, but there are a number, a good number of, you know, exotic species that have established here. Are any of them major vectors of plant diseases, the invasives? I'm trying to think of invasives. Um, well, the, the glassy wing sharpshooter actually is not native to California, um, is native to the southeastern United States, but um, got established out there. so. That's one, um, but that was sort of all within the United States. Um, but um, let's see, I, I, I can't think of any right now. There might be, but they're just not coming to mind. Okay, thanks a lot. Enjoy mm -hmm. your time. Okay, um, did you have I another question? I can add a quick note about that. Um, I think I forget the names of the leafhoppers, but my boss at the National Park Service, Jim Sherald, who studied Dutch elm disease and bacterial leaf scorch and stuff for his career, he was a plant pathologist. He uh, collected leafhoppers during the winters and um, would look at them for the possibility of transmitting bacterial leaf scorch. And he had some data on that, but I don't know if it was ever conclusive, but, um, you know, it's possible they were instrumental or in some way, you know, transmitting bacterial leaf scorch. I just thought I'd add that. So. Thank you. George, did you have another question? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I didn't. I, is my uh, my hand still up? Yeah, your hand's still up. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't know you have to close it out. Oh, lower hand. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry about that. No, no problem. Um, okay. I mean, I just, just, I was really like amazed by the diversity of the the genitalia in, in these things. Um, kind of remind me of. Of a, a fly family I studied called Spheroceridae. That there are all these little brown flies, and they all look alike. But the if you look at the genitalia, they're just incredibly diverse. They kind of went bonkers there. So I don't know if there's some relationship between being dull and looking alike and <laughs> having a genitalic 
variety or not. Oh, cat is um, you, you mentioned early on that um, they got to have fun <clears throat> some way. That would be yeah, cool too. You mentioned early on that like the it seems like a large percentage of the um, diversity of, of, of leafhoppers is unknown. And then like your your study seems to, to show that like kind of the, you know, the vast majority of them are, are new and it seems like you're not even close to, um, you know, finding them all, you, you know, if so many of them are just from single places. Is that pretty typical of, you know, publications on leafhoppers? Yeah, it is, you know, um, it's, well, one, a lot of more collecting needs to be done. There are so many, I, I think if anybody did a good survey, for example, of South American grasslands, you would just find tons and tons of new species. So yeah, uh, there, there are lots more to, to, to be found. Um, and yeah, it, it uh, for for other groups of, of leafhoppers, it's a similar situation. Um, and you know, um, especially for um, the smallest leafhoppers, the subfamily Typhlosabini, um, there um, right now the the number of species is close to. I, I mentioned that Delta Cephalini is the um, contains the highest number of described species. Typhlosabini is close, but they're really tiny leafhoppers and fewer people have had the patience, I think, to work on them. Um, and they're probably like, if it was our, all said and done and we knew actually how many species there, I think Typhlosabini would probably be much larger than, than Delta Cephalini. So um, there are groups like that, that, that just need a lot of work. Um, so yeah, still, still tons to describe. Yeah. Um, speak, one last comment too. Um, you were talking about the the Sahado and you know how some species were from there, and so you're not sure if they're on grasses or other things. There there are like a lot of um, there's, like, there's a lot of like gallery forest along the the rivers there. And, okay. And like with with Anastrafa, they're they're definitely you know forest insects, but there's a number of like interesting species that are from those kinds of areas, but you know they're definitely like in the in the forest, not out in the open. Okay, yeah, I think that the ten eucephalus that I have from there are were collected in the lace traps, so it's really uncertain what they what they were on or exactly exactly where they were. So, okay, all right. Well, if there's no further questions. Um, just want to thank Jamie for a great talk, and we can. Turn it back over to Lourdes. Thank you. Great. Right. Thank you, Jamie. That was that was great. Thank you, everybody. Great. <laughs> great talk. There's a, a few comments in the chat, and you very can very much, you can very much it. enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Okay. okay just a last reminder about uh, the, our next meeting on the third of February again at seven p.m. on Thursday, and uh, speaker will be Dr. Wilkin, and uh, Discover Life in America. And with that, uh, do I have a motion to uh, adjourn? Make it. Okay, and second, I think I see it. Okay, great. Well, it's great seeing everyone. Please stay safe. Yeah. And the meeting is adjourned. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Right. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. bye, everyone. Thank you. Good meeting. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.